Good evening everyone. Welcome to Bajira YAS Academy, the Hindu news analysis. Today is 8th September 2024 and today there are some important articles for the discussion and one by one we'll try to discuss all these important articles in a very detailed manner and before discussing them, yesterday there was a previous uh, prelims based practice question and this question is based on Agni 4 intermediate range ballistic missile. Question is, recently India has completed a successful test fire of Agni-4 ballistic missile. Consider the following statements regarding Agni-4 missile. Options are uh, 1. It is a surface to air missile. Option 2. It can hit targets up to 4000 kilometers of range. And option 3. The Agni-4 missile are desi designed and developed by the Defense Research and Development Organization. So, if you look at a statement 1, statement 1 is absolutely incorrect because it is not surface to air missile, it is usually surface to surface missile. So, therefore, this statement is clearly incorrect, and if you eliminate this first statement, you get the correct answer in this question because. Agni-4 missile can hit the target of up to 4000 km range and third statement the Agni missiles are designed and developed by the Defense Research and Development Organization. So the correct answer for this question is option C and yesterday we have discussed about this Agni-4 missiles and during the discussion I have given some specifications and features of Agni-4 missile. Now, if you look at the features of Agni-4 missile, so it is an intermediate range ballistic missile and it can hit a targets of up to 4000 kilometers and the 20 meter range missile can usually carry a payload weight of 1000 kg and can be fired from the road mobile launcher and it is a surface to surface missile uh, that usually means it can be fired from the surface and it can also hit the targets uh, on the enemy territory in the surface itself and it is a mobile two stage solid fuel system and Agni missiles are designed and developed by the Defense Research and Development Organization. So these are some of the features of the Agni 4 ballistic missile. And today we have a one a very interesting, very important prelims practice question. Remember, this is very important because UPSC has already asked a question on this Volbachia method. The Volbachia method, sometimes seen in news, is regarding the control of which of the following diseases. There are four diseases which were given A. Dengue, B. Plague, C. Covid, and D. Tuberculosis. Try to answer this question in the comment section, and correct answer will be providing you in tomorrow's class. So we'll start the first uh, article in this discussion. The very first article is that uh, external affairs minister S. J. Shankar on Sunday arrived in Saudi Arabia's capital Riyadh to attend the first India Gulf Cooperation Council countries foreign meeting or foreign ministers meeting. So this was the reason because of this particular reason. Indian external affairs minister S. J. Shankar uh, you know arrived in Saudi Arabia's capital Riyadh right so uh, we will understand why Gulf cooperation countries are very very important for India there are number of reasons because of all these reasons Gulf cooperation Con council countries are very important so uh, if you look at those important reasons diaspora is a uh, one reason and uh, energy security is another important reason for India's engagement with the Gulf Cooperation Council countries. So when we talk about diaspora, again remittances a very important source of forex for us and energy security, stability and peace in the region is also important. Stability and peace. India have stakes, uh, you know, on peace and stability in Middle East. So because of that reason also it is very important. Trade and commerce, another area of India's engagement with these Gulf Cooperation Council countries. And because of all these reasons, India has been looking to further strengthen its relationship with the Gulf Cooperation Council countries. 
and we will understand what is this gulf cooperation council and how many countries are part of the gulf cooperation council in the middle east gulf cooperation council is a political and an economic alliance of six countries now how we have asian association of southeast asian nations how we have bimstec bay of bengal initiative for multi sectoral technical and economic cooperation in a similar way for the greater political and economic cooperation among most of the countries in the middle east the gulf cooperation council was formed with the six countries in the arabian peninsula so what are those six countries the countries which are highlighted here saudi arabia oman uae qatar bahrain kuwait so these six countries a part of the gulf cooperation council this gulf cooperation council was established in the year 1981 and gulf cooperation council countries promotes economic security cultural and social cooperation between all the six countries themselves and because of that reason india wanted to collectively engage with all the gulf cooperation council countries and in fact gcc holds a summit every year to discuss cooperation on regional affairs right so these are some basic details with respect to the gulf cooperation council and how the gulf cooperation council is a very important very significant for india so we will understand this as well so together the gulf cooperation council countries possesses almost half of the world's oil reserves in terms of ensuring energy security for india it is very very important why because the gulf cooperation council countries together consists of almost half of the world's oil reserves and in fact the gulf cooperation council countries are the suppliers which account for around 34% of india's crude oil imports as well so this is also another very important reason for india's enhanced india's uh, expanded relations with the gulf cooperation council countries currently the region is expanding beyond the energy sector now the region has also looking to diversify its economies particularly focusing on areas such as tourism construction and finance because remember that the fossil fuels fossil fuels are not renewable fuels and they are depleting at a faster pace and because of that reason since these economies are primarily dependent on oil so now because of non renewable nature of these resources the gulf cooperation council countries now looking to diversify their economies and now they are focusing on other fields other sectors such as tourism construction real estate and finance and this diversification of their respective economies opens up more opportunities for trade and investment for countries like india because india is located very close to these middle eastern countries and india is a rising economic power and because of that reason it actually holds a lot of opportunities for india in the middle east however indian diaspora in the middle east accounts for around 8.9 to 9 million people and diaspora is also a very very important to further strengthen the bonds between india and the gulf cooperation council countries right so as per the rbi report the remittances sent from this gulf cooperation council countries stands to be around 30% of the total remittances that india received from abroad if you look at the total remittances that india has been receiving every year as per the world bank estimates we have been receiving around 110 billion worth of remittances every year and it is one of its highest and india is one of the highest country to receive remittances from other countries and apart from these important and the significant aspects of gulf cooperation council countries so gulf cooperation council countries are also very very important from the geo strategic angle because the gulf cooperation council countries sit across persian gulf which is an important sea lane for the global trade now we have to understand how persian gulf is very very important for 
the global energy trade or you know the global trade not just the persian gulf the suez canal red sea gulf of aden and strait of hormuz so everything are very very important and most of the gulf cooperation council countries are located in the key sea lanes of communication and from strategic point of view india and gulf cooperation council countries share the desire for political stability and security in the region and because of all these reasons gulf cooperation council countries are very very important for india and so we will try to understand in a very detailed manner india and gulf cooperation council countries relations and if you look at some data with respect to economic and uh, you know trade related uh, relations between india and these gulf cooperation council countries during the financial year 2324 india and gulf cooperation council countries bilateral trade stood at us dollars 161.59 billion and this is huge one of its highest as well and in fact so if you look at india's total exports to the gulf cooperation council countries so these exports stands at us dollars 56.3 billion in the financial year 2324 and india's total imports from the gulf cooperation council countries stands at 105.3 billion us dollars in the very same financial year and this indicating that the trade balance is heavily in favor of these gulf cooperation council countries or we have the trade deficit with the gulf cooperation council countries and there is a reason for that the reason is a huge energy imports from the gulf cooperation council countries and because of this reason so we have a huge a trade deficit or trade balance which is in favor of this gcc countries and in fact the india's economic linkages with the gulf cooperation council countries have increased steadily especially due to a growth in oil imports in recent times and this is the economic and trade relations between india and gcc countries and apart from that india gcc free trade agreement negotiations have been taken place however we do not have any free trade agreement as of now however both india and gulf cooperation council countries together are strongly committed to have a free trade agreement with each other so that would further tap the potential and that would further strengthen enhance trade and commerce between india and gulf cooperation council countries so if you look into this details india and gulf cooperation council countries signed a framework agreement for enhancing and developing economic cooperation between the two sides in new delhi august 20 2004 However, India Gulf Cooperation Council countries free trade agreement is under negotiation and if there is a free trade agreement between India and Gulf Cooperation Council countries so that may benefit from some renewed momentum following the India UAE free trade agreement as of now India and UAE have the free trade agreement and this India and UAE free trade agreement could inspire a free trade agreement between gcc and india as well and apart from that indian diaspora and remittances and another a very important area of cooperation and engagement between india and gcc countries so according to some latest figures there are approximately 8.9 million to 9 million indian expats who are residing in most of these gulf cooperation council countries and that is approximately 66% of indian resident populations or non resident indian populations living in other countries however according to reserve bank of india's remittances survey of 2021 the share of remittances from gcc region in india india's inward remittances is estimated to have declined from more than 50% in the year 2016-17 to about 30% in 2021 and due to covid-19 pandemic in recent times we have seen reverse migration and the reverse migration is one of its highest from the middle eastern countries and that would further lead to the declining remittances from the middle eastern countries now i hope all of you have a fair idea about remittances remittances usually means the money that the worker 
members or the diaspora in the Middle East or the Gulf Cooperation Council countries would earn and they would send the money back to their families in India and that is known as the remittances right so this is India and Gulf Cooperation Council countries and because of Gulf Cooperation Council countries significance for India and they are a very very important and that's why India has sent external affairs minister S. J. Shankar to discuss these number of areas with the first India GCC foreign minister summit meeting. The next article that we are going to discuss is about the uh, you know a climate change driven disasters and how India has becoming more and more vulnerable to extreme weather patterns because of the climate change the article which is given in the Hindu which is very very important for your gender studies paper 1 and gender studies paper 3 as well right the heading is that over 85 percentage of Indian districts exposed to extreme climate events so this number would increase and the intent intensity of such extreme climate events or weather related disasters would increase over a period of time so we will understand the context and then we'll detail we'll try to discuss this in a very detailed manner so india has been witnessing an alarming or increased rise in the climate extremes with over 85 percentage of indian districts are vulnerable to different disasters such as floods droughts cyclones and even heat waves as well so these many number of disasters which have been impacting india every year according to a recent study by ipe global and esri india approximately 45 percentage of the districts have been experiencing a significant shift in climate patterns so that effectively means that the intensity of these climate patterns or the climate change driven disasters have been increasing over a period of time so therefore with regions traditionally prone to floods are now facing droughts and even vice versa as well imagine that earlier there are some regions which are highly prone to floods now now those regions have been facing extreme drought like conditions but vice versa also like earlier there are some regions across India which have been suffering which have faced worst droughts now those regions are under extreme floods so this is how the weather patterns have been becoming more and more extreme as well and in fact this particular report has highly also highlighted the urgency of the climate action from India's point of view and in this context so the report has also talked about escalating climate extremes in India so according to this report there is a twofold increase in drought events both agricultural drought and even meteorological droughts as well and this would lead to the very often failure of crops distress in agriculture and uh, farmer suicides migration from rural areas to urban areas and food security challenges lack of income security and lack of job security and poor living standards of the people because of the increase in the drought events both agricultural droughts as well as the meteorological droughts as well and apart from that there is a fourfold increase in the cyclone events and in recent times we have seen how the intensity and frequency of cyclones both in the arabian sea and as well as the bay of bengal region has been increased enormously and that has threatened the entire coastal area of india and apart from that there is a staggering rise in flood frequency particularly in eastern and northeastern and even southern india and the frequency and the intensity of such major disasters or climate extremes in india have surged by fourfold in recent decades with the last decade alone witnessing the fivefold increase and this data is very very important whenever you write an answer on india's vulnerability to climate change driven disasters you must write this data to make your answer more and more impactful and you should also draw a map of india and in that particular map you need to clearly show the vulnerability of india to various disasters 
contrast us. For example, the color coded pattern here, the yellow color indicates the central peninsular plateau, which is vulnerable to heat waves, forest fires and drought like conditions. And the coastal plains and western ghats and eastern ghats are vulnerable to landslides, cyclones, urban floods and even heavy precipitation. Such presentation would ensure that you will be given more and more marks compared to your fellow uh, aspirants as well. And apart from that, there's a change uh, in risk landscape in India, right? So more than 60% of the districts in India so particularly some states such as Bihar, Andhra Pradesh, Odisha, Gujarat, Rajasthan and even Assam. So these states and 60% of the districts in all these states have been experiencing multiple extreme climate events simultaneously and even back to back. There are a number of reasons for the same. So the reasons included rising greenhouse gas emissions is one reason because of the anthropogenic factors increased use of fossil fuels there has been a rising amount of greenhouse gas emissions and unplanned urbanization and unplanned urbanization has been making urban areas more and more vulnerable to these disasters whether heat waves floods drought like conditions everything urban areas are becoming more and more vulnerable and apart from that there are also certain unsustainable anthropogenic activities which have been exacerbating these disasters as well for example deforestation is considered as anthropogenic activity which is unsustainable right so and encroachment of the flood plains and encroachment of the you know wetlands so all these things are considered as unsustainable anthropogenic activities which have been exacerbating further increasing the intensity and frequency of such disasters and there is also a visible change in land use and that further leads to the environmental changes as well and this study has also identified is a 65 percentage of the change in land use and land cover patterns across the climate hotspots and microclimatic shifts which are being driven by deforestation mangrove destruction and unplanned land use are further contributing to the intensification of these events as well and there are areas that once experienced frequent floods such as shrikakulam Katak, Guntur are now witnessing a drought conditions and even vice versa as well. However, southern states like Andhra Pradesh, Tamil Nadu, Karnataka are particularly seeing a rise in drought like conditions because of the climate change and other extreme weather events which have been leading to these number of disasters. However, technology can be used to address these specific issues and in fact the study has highlighted and emphasized the role that geographical information system technology can play in building climate resilience. And in fact, with its advanced spatial analysis tools, geographical information systems can usually integrate diverse data sources and those diverse data sources can provide geographical understanding of the existing climate risks. However, there are certain solutions like Climate Risk Observatory CRO can help stakeholders to understand the sector specific impacts and also fostering a better planning and adaptation strategies and all these adaptation strategies and better planning is very very important to achieve the climate resilience or disaster resilience to build resilient infrastructure and also they are part of mitigation and adaptation measures for these extreme climate events. The report also recommends infrastructure climate fund which is also known as ICF to support a sustained investments in the areas in the arenas of climate resilient infrastructure focusing on risk management and even locally led climate actions as well. Right. So according to this report, there are states with the highest vulnerability index rank. So those states are Assam, Andhra Pradesh, Maharashtra, Karnataka, Bihar, Manipur, Rajasthan, Arunachal Pradesh, Shikkim and Odisha. 
right so this is all about increasing vulnerability and how technology could actually ensure the resilience to such disasters that we have been experiencing in india and next very important article which is in news is about uh, we very often uh, heard about sunita williams uh, indian origin astronaut from nasa uh, she was working in international space station but she was stuck in international space space station because boeing uh, starliner which is about to bring astronauts including sunita, sunita william back to back to earth has been facing certain problems or we can say that boeing starliner has a faulty propulsion system and because of that reason these astronauts in the international space station uh, are were not able to uh, brought them back through this starliner so without these astronauts boeing starliner returns to earth so that means that these astronauts including sunita williams will spend few more months in the international space station so it will not be possible for them for for the nasa to bring them back uh, immediately right so it is expected that she would she along with another astronaut so they will be brought back to earth so next year february so what is the context the context is that recently two nasa astronauts uh, aboard the boeing starliner will stay on the international space station for months because of this faulty propulsion system whose problems included crucial helium leaks right so this helium leak is also in use and we will understand what is this what exactly uh, a helium leak in the uh, you know a, a boeing starliner which has been facing the faulty propulsion system and because of that reason sunita williams was not brought back to earth from the international space station through boeing starliner so so when a boeing starliner uh, yesterday it, it was brought back to earth but uh, there were no astronauts inside this boeing starliner okay so we'll understand all the details about this so uh, first and foremost try to understand a few things about the international space station so international space station is the largest modular space station in low earth orbit and it is also the largest human made structure in the space now apart from the international space station china has also been building its own international space station and we also have have india also has uh, plans to build its own space station by the year 2035 and international space station was launched uh, on 20th november 1988 from kazakhstan a central asian country and the mission life is expected to operate till the year 2030 and in fact the international space station orbits low earth orbit of earth at an average altitude of 400 km and even it circles the globe every 92 to 93 meters uh, minutes right uh, the size of the international space station it almost weighs uh, weighs 450 Uh, tons and in fact international space station is a collaborative you know uh, uh, mission of different space agencies including us of nasa europe european space agency japan's jaxa and canada's uh, csa and russia's roscosmos so all these space agencies are involved to build the international space station remember china is not part of this uh, you know international space station uh, mission and in fact so if you look into the components of the international space station so it is divided into two components uh, two sections the russian orbital segment which is being operated by russia and united states orbital segment run by united states and other countries now what is the significance of the international space station the significance is that it serves as a microgravity and space environment research laboratory and apart from that more than 3000 experiments have been conducted Uh, about this international space station and another uh, notable thing that we need to mention here is that india plans to have its own space station by the year 2035 which would weigh around 20 ton and in fact this 
इंडियन यू नो स्पेस स्टेशन वुड ऑर्बिट एट एन ऑल्टीट्यूड ऑफ फोर हंड्रेड किलोमीटर अबाउ द अर्थ वेयर एस्ट्रोनॉट्स कुड स्टे फॉर फिफ्टीन टू ट्वेंटी डेज एंड इन फैक्ट नासा एंड इसरो टू लॉन्च अ जॉइंट मिशन टू इंटरनेशनल स्पेस स्टेशन इन द ईयर as well so these are some details with respect to the international space station uh, and now we'll understand uh, some facts about the helium leakage so what is helium and helium is considered as inert gas and helium does not react with the other substances or it does not combust and in fact the atomic number of helium is just 2 therefore making it the second lightest element after hydrogen and hydrogen and helium are a two uh, you know uh, elements which are uh, abundant uh, on the sun and in fact helium also has a very low boiling point so just 268.9 degree celsius allowing it to remain a gas even in super cold environments as well and in fact helium uh, gas is non toxic but cannot be breathed on its own because it's it displaces the oxygen humans need for the respiration so these are some facts with respect to the helium inert gas and why and how helium is used in rockets and in fact helium is used to pressurize the fuel tanks and that would ensure fuel flows to the rockets engines without interruption and for the cooling systems as well as fuel and oxidizer are burned to give energy to the rocket engines helium fills the resulting empty space in the tanks and maintaining the overall pressure inside these tanks however because it's non reactive in nature it can safely mingle with the tanks residual contents so is it prone to leaks the helium leak which is in use and because of that reason boeing's starliner uh, did not able to bring back the astronauts from the international space station and because of that reason they have to spend a few more months in the international space station so helium's small atomic size and even a lower molecular weight means its atoms can escape through a small gaps or even seals in storage tanks and fuel systems but because there is a very little helium in the earth's atmosphere leaks can be easily detected and making the gas important for spotting the potential for faults within the rocket or the spacecraft's fuel systems and which is also known as the helium leakage so that indicates there's a faulty propulsion system which is present in the boeing's starliner and because of that reason astronauts were brought back to were not brought back to the earth and today we have a one important very important mains practice question regarding india's energy dependency on the middle eastern countries india's imports of energy from other countries the question is analyze government initiatives to reduce india's energy import dependency in the backdrop of a recent rise in petroleum and oil prices and also suggest some measures for the same as well remember that we have been importing 85% of our energy needs from other countries so this indicates there's a huge dependency of india on other countries to import energy so therefore such a huge dependency would not be a good would not be sustainable for any country in the longer term so therefore it is very important that india needs to achieve self sufficiency in energy production energy consumption and india should also achieve energy security on its own not depending substantially on other countries so therefore uh, how we can structure this particular question approach is very very important so if you look at the approach first and foremost you just introduce the question by mentioning india's huge import dependency and then analyze government initiatives to reduce energy dependency and then suggest some measures to achieve self reliance and energy security in india and ultimately you can conclude this answer and if you look at the introduction of this question so we all knew that in recent times fuel prices have uh, you know uh, skyrocketed and rising fuel prices actually shows that 
the need for clean sources of energy right so uh, when there are uh, abundant clean sources of energy available and we also have the technology to tap the potential of clean sources of energy so that could uh, essentially ensure that these conventional fuel prices would not increase uh, arbitrarily and indiscriminately however expanding and even diversifying energy supply is very important but if india is to reduce its energy import remember i've told you that india has been importing 85 percentage of its energy needs energy requirements from other countries a huge energy dependence so india must look towards its first managing uh, the demand for petroleum products right so in this context the first part of the answer uh, we need to analyze the government initiatives to reduce india's energy imports so first and foremost uh, indian government has started ethanol blending program we all knew that ethanol is uh, a non polluting eco friendly uh, fuel that can be produced from the renewable sources so ethanol blending program essentially aimed that blending this renewable fuel with the uh, non renewable sources so that uh, you know uh, a pollution can be uh, minimized and india's import dependence on fuels can also be substantially minimized so the share of bioethanol in petrol has increased to nearly 8 percentage by volume under 2018 national policy on the biofuels and apart from that government has set a target of 10% bioethanol blending of petrol by 2022 and to rise it to 20% by 2030 under the ethanol blended petrol program so these are the ambitious targets of blending petrol uh, blending ethanol in petrol and apart from that the government has also launched fame 1 and fame 2 programs which is faster adaptation and mobilization of electric vehicles right so the focus of the fame 1 and fame 2 program is to introduce electric vehicles onto indian roads in a large scale so the objective of fame 1 and fame 2 program is to bring at least 30 percentage of all vehicles in india under electric vehicles by the year 2030 and pm kusum program pradhan mantri uh this is a program which is essentially aimed at uh, setting up solar pump sets and also uh, making farmers earn an alternative income through generating electricity uh, through the solar pump sets and at the same time they can they could actually generate electricity energy on their own okay so so pm kusum usually aims to provide financial and even water security to farmers through harnessing solar energy capacities of 25750 megawatt by the year 2022 and apart from that we all knew that the government has also launched national hydrogen energy mission and in fact being a zero carbon fuel hydrogen is known as a zero carbon fuel and hydrogen is considered to be one of the key sources of clean energy for the future for the future so therefore in order to make india a hub of a uh, green hydrogen production national green hydrogen mission was started by the government and there are certain measures which needs to be undertaken in order to ensure uh, that india is not dependent on other countries for its energy requirements so what are those measures which needs to be taken and the national mission for enhanced energy efficiency so this particular national mission for enhanced energy efficiency should conduct a thorough cost benefit analysis of available energy efficient technologies so whatever energy efficient technologies which are available so they have to be analyzed in a very detailed manner and products across all sectors especially agriculture housing and transportation at the institutional level as well the national and state designed agencies working in the area of energy efficiency should be further strengthened a large program should be launched to tap at least 50 percentage of the biogas potential in the country by supporting technology and credit support through nabard by 2020 and 
we also have a civil nuclear cooperation agreement with the united states indo us nuclear deal opened new vistas for india in the field of nuclear energy so that facilitates a cutting edge technology and even nuclear fuel as well and apart from that so india even started engaging with countries such as china kazakhstan and australia for the nuclear fuel remember nuclear fuel is also considered as one of the sustainable sources of of a fuel and in order to reduce our dependence on conventional fuels and fossil fuels we must look for alternative energy resources such as nuclear fuel as well as of now we do not have adequate technology with respect to the nuclear energy production rather we have been engaging with the like minded countries such as russia france for uh, you know developing technologies with respect to generation of energy from the nuclear power however so ultimately you could conclude the answer stressing on the importance of achieving energy security for india so major transformations are currently underway in the global energy sector from growing electrification to the expansion of renewable energy so this particular trend we all knew about it and there are upheavals in oil production and globalization of natural gas markets and in this context India needs to build its capacity in research and skill building to deal with these transformations in the energy sector and that is a very important for India to ensure or to achieve energy security in the long term and that's all in this lecture and thank you so much if you like our work please subscribe our youtube channel and also hit the like button thank you